Hello, I'm Infamous Fear. What's that? It's time for Infamous Queer! Pride, 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 darling, darling, pride, pride, 95! Ah, Germany, a country I'm barely qualified to talk about. I'm a quarter German, but not from Berlin. I have a very faint grasp on the language, and I haven't even been to the capital city of Germany. So with that in mind, who better to tell you about the history of the GDR? In November, it was exactly 25 years since the Berlin Wall fell and a city divided was united. Suddenly, East Berliners no longer had to drive around in cardboard cars, worry about being spied on by the Stasi, or watch their politicians constantly making out. After almost 50 years of oppression, the East had regained its freedom. But over this time period, the East had developed a very distinctive culture, founded on different morals than the West. Restrictions on trade and culture from the government meant that the Eastern Bloc had to produce its own products, raise its own food, and create its own media. Some countries behind the Iron Curtain got around this by secretly translating and distributing Western media. This led to a particular style of translation still quite common among former Soviet countries. Others, like East Germany, decided to produce their very own communist-sanctioned government-funded culture. Radio, TV, plays, and most importantly, movies. East German films were produced by one studio and one studio only. Deutsche Film Aktien Gesellschaft, or DEFR, or DEFA. I don't know how the acronym was actually pronounced, so for the sake of convenience, I'm going to go with DEFA. DEFA functioned like a parallel universe Hollywood, reflecting the cultural norms expected from the government in society, except instead of promoting Western values of religiousness, nuclear families, and manifest destiny, the GDR's different ideals resulted in different kinds of films. Hollywood made Westerns, promoting the settlement of white people across the allegedly uncivilized continent. Deerfar, on the other hand, produced Austens, or Red Westerns, which took the side of the Native Americans. Hollywood made musicals, and so did Deerfar. <laughs> and when Hollywood was finally deciding to acknowledge the existence of queer people, Deerfar was too. However, they were a little less prolific than Hollywood. While Hollywood managed to produce dozens of queer-themed films before 1990, Deerfa only managed to make one, right at the very last minute. Typical of the Eastern Bloc to not even offer me a choice. So, this is East Germany's only gay movie, then. This is coming out. Well, 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 the world's come tumbling down. You know, no, the world's come tumbling down. The world's come tumbling down. Ah, yes, coming out. This 1989 film was directed by noted dare for film director Heine Karo, and was indeed the only gay movie to ever come out of East Germany, premiering on the 9th of November, the last night of the country's existence. Apparently, they stopped the film midway through the premiere when the border opened, and most of the audience demanded to see the end of the film before joining the crowds outside. So yes, this is a film that was technically irrelevant before its premiere even concluded. But how does it hold up today? Well, there's nothing to do but begin. The film begins with an ambulance being called for a young man named Matthias, who has just tried to kill himself. Well, that's cheery. What follows is an extended scene of gastric lavage. And by extended, I mean four minutes of a man reaching through a tube into a bucket and crying. When an uncomfortable scene goes for that long, you begin to wonder whether the director had a fetish for that kind of thing. After the director has satisfied his urges, we see Matthias being harangued by a handy crap nurse. I've been schwul. I've been homosexual. <laughs> Matthias. Ich weine deswegen. <laughs> and then, courtesy of the GDR, the most utilitarian title sequence ever. Then, suddenly, it turns out that Matthias wasn't the main character, but was instead just a means for Heine Karo to fulfil his weird fetish for now obsolete medical practices, because apparently our main character is Philip, a man whose pants are so tight that we can see his vast deference. Do you wanna shake it? Yeah. So come on, shake it. No. Say what? My pants are too tight and I can't let myself go. Well, I guess that's the director's other fetish. Philip is a teacher, despite the fact that he looks like he should still be in school himself. He starts a day by running into a woman, whose nose immediately begins to fountain all over the place. 
This woman, who looks like Mark McKinney in drag, is Tanya. Morning, Tanya! Conveniently enough, she had a crush on Philip when the two of them were in high school together. So, last week, I guess. And the two of them immediately decide to get married? Ah yes, nothing better than a good old folk dance to get me in the mood. As I learned from German educational videos, folk dancers while wearing overalls and braces are the backbone of Berlin's social scene. After Philip and his new wife engage in some more jollity, we see some racism on the train. Philip intervenes and gets a nosebleed for his trouble. Another nosebleed. Heine Kardor must have had a fetish for that too. <sighs> Wait, why am I reviewing this? This seems pretty hetero. I mean, we had that random gay guy at the beginning, but everything else so far has just been folk dancing and 15 year olds getting married to Mark McKinney and drag and weird makeup and well, I guess that doesn't sound very hetero, but where's the legitimate homosexuality? Well, like all things in East Germany, I guess we'll just have to wait for it. Let's hope it gets here sooner than it's rebant. Philip goes to visit his mother, who is judgmental and unpleasant. Früher warst du anders. Das ist doch Unsinn. Früher war ich ein Kind, habe ich hier gewohnt. Ach, Ausreden, das sind doch alles Ausreden. You're still a fucking kid. You're ten years old. Du hast eine Freundin? Hm? Seit wann? Ein paar Wochen. Tja, die... Die musst du uns doch unbedingt... Anyway, his mother's amazement at his impending marriage makes sense when we find out that Philip was gay once. He went out with a guy called Renford, who reunites with Philip in a strange scene heralded with a weird guitar sting. After a look imbued with significance, Philip is now reminded of his past and is now tortured with secret gay. And when you're tortured with secret gay, what better place to go than a gay club where everyone will immediately hit on you? Unlike my experience of gay clubs, Philip doesn't end up talking to a 40-year-old Quebecois guy about serial killers and architecture, but instead does something almost as improbable. He reunites us, the viewers, with Gastric Lavache Piero here. Phew, I was beginning to suspect that we'd never see him again. It was almost like the director forgot that he was a character. The next day, Philip goes to visit Renford. Renford is not particularly pleased with Philip's sudden reappearance in his life, seeing as Philip's parents actually bribed Renford to never see Philip again. Es ist nicht wahr, dass du mit mir nicht mehr in einer Klasse bleiben wolltest. Du bist nicht krank geworden wegen des Ekels von mir. Du hast nicht deine Eltern zu mir geschickt. Peinlich, peinlich, sie haben unseren Sohn zu homosexuellen Handlungen verführt. Nein! Und du weißt auch nicht, nicht, dass deine Eltern mir das Fahrrad geschenkt haben. Und den Zirkelkasten. Als, als Ersatz für dich. Philip runs out, spooked by a sudden weird musical sting, and finds himself in the subway, where he fails to protect a queer guy from being attacked. Tanya notices that Philip isn't himself. He dismisses her concerns and decides to distract himself by doing some East German things, like waiting in lines and pulling violin and cake out of nowhere. Oh look, there's Matthias. Nice of him to become an active part in this movie. So sieht man sich also wieder. Komisch. Sie. Sind Sie sicher, dass wir ver verwechseln Sie mich auch nicht? Du heißt Philip. The two then proceed to do some even more East German things, like randomly being told of a stranger's grief about her dead child. Der hier. Hübscher Kerl, wa? Der war auch immer ganz verrückt nach Konzerten. Aber auch Konzerten. Vor zwölf. Nee, vor 13 Jahren ist er unter dem Laster. Mit einer Java. War mein einzigster. Well, in a totalitarian state, you may as well share the misery around, I guess? To cut a long story short, Matthias invites Philip to a party, saying he understands Philip's obvious confusion about his sexuality. Philip says he can't go, but after reading his wife some Wizard of Oz porn, he sneaks out of the house and meets Matthias and his family. Ist eigentlich, dass meine Oma in ihrer Jugend Gedichte geschrieben hat? Ganz, ganz erotische. And now, commence sex scene.
Unfortunately, a party and sex and a nice guy who doesn't look like a kids in the hall character aren't enough for Philip when he learns that Tanya might be pregnant. Paul Matthias tries to find Philip again and runs into him at the concert they were buying tickets for earlier. He then inadvertently outs Philip. Philip! <laughs> Na? Oh, Mann. <laughs> Warum warst du denn nie zu Hause? Oops. Wait a minute. Didn't we see this before? I guess the lesson is, if you're German and secretly gay, don't make out in a public place. And probably try and avoid nosebleeds too. They'll never end well for you. Now that both of his possible partners are extremely upset with him, there's nothing for Philip to do but have an emo wank. Sadly, this doesn't seem to make him feel much better, so he decides to salt his own wound by going to speak to his mother, who continues to be a completely repellent tool and a rotten example of a parent. I wanted to know that you are happy with each other. Well, fuck you too! Philip decides to look for Matthias, only to find out that Matthias isn't too happy to see him. Is, is all okay, nicht? Okay? Bist du Strohwitwa? Oder hast du wieder meine Nacht Urlaub? What a surprise! Philip is now miserable and desperate, and tries to hit on anyone and everyone, only to be rejected for being, well, miserable and desperate. Enraged, he decides to kill an old man? Thankfully, it turns out that the old man isn't so easy to kill, and is now going to dole out a heaping helping of life lessons to the shitty whining 15 year old he sees before him. The old man reminds Philip that at one stage, being gay was a much more horrendous prospect than it is for him now because of some camps and some government policies that Philip might have potentially heard of. Ein Mann nur gab es für mich die große Liebe. Das ist 50 Jahre her, weil er bis heute nicht bei uns denunziert hat. Und aus dem Zelt herausgezerrt, verhaftet, abtransportiert, Berlin, Lötzenstraße, Stapo. Yeah, I think if the alternative is Nazism, you're doing pretty well for yourself. The old man then takes the opportunity to carefully shoehorn some communist propaganda into the movie, and then, after having schooled Philip, he leaves in a state-approved puff. So, after a shitty period in his life, losing both his wife and his boyfriend, and pissing off seemingly every member of East Berlin's gay community, what is there for Philip now? A mandatory workplace assessment, of course! Gewisse Vorkommnisse, über die wir noch an anderer Stelle reden müssen, zwingen uns leider dazu, mit verstärkten Hospitationen der Schulleitung zu beginnen. Heute für Sie unvorbereitet. Philip decides that this would be the perfect time to zone out and not do anything, probably because he realizes that under the GDR's policy of 100% employment, he can't technically be fired. Joke's on you, Philip! Wait a couple of days and the GDR will be over, and you'll lose your job due to non-performance. Ha! Oh well, at least those looser pants will mean that you won't be completely infertile within two years, so that's something. And then the movie ends, in a manner apparently both inspired by being there and windows. What the ever-living fuck? So, uh, that was a unique experience, reflecting a unique city and a unique set of values that would soon fade out of existence. But what does it have to say about LGBT rights in Eastern Germany? First things first, we have to remember that Deerfer was a government company and served the values of the communist regime. As a result, all movies had some degree of propaganda inserted into them, and thus this film can't be taken as a completely accurate representation of what life was like for LGBT people at the time. In theory, the tenets of socialism and communism promote equality in a number of ways, including equality between the sexes and a more scientific, rational understanding of sexuality, as opposed to capitalism's traditional values, patriarchal societal structures, and the morals of Abrahamic religions, which typically tend to consider LGBT identities as aberrations. However, in practice, socialist and communist societies weren't necessarily as progressive as you'd think. Homosexuality was made legal in the GDR in 1968, one year before West Germany, but it still remained a taboo. 
East Germany was, in theory, an atheistic nation, therefore there weren't many moral arguments to be made against LGBT people. However, the government wasn't particularly keen on queer people, labelling LGBT identities as a bourgeois perversion, leading many LGBT people to be harassed and spied on by the Stasi. Ich als Parteimitglied dürfe doch nicht schwul sein und das sogar noch propagieren. Ja, und dann nach fünf Minuten war ich raus und war aus der Partei ausgeschlossen und wusste, das war's. This may have had something to do with the fact that the GDR were trying to encourage people to have a nuclear family and crank out children in order to keep the state going, to counteract how many people were desperate to leave. Strangely, LGBT groups found support not from the atheistic government, but from the Protestant church. The Stasi responded by sending attractive single men as spies to infiltrate LGBT groups, as well as to seduce and blackmail West German politicians and officials. Strangely, you're not going to find any of this side of East German history in coming out. The film presents a variety of viewpoints. Philip's family are conservative and want him to have a heterosexual marriage, and he worries that he will be punished in the workplace for his sexuality. On the other hand, Matthias' family appear to accept him, and as for his suicide attempt, it's unclear whether he tried to kill himself before he found acceptance among his family and in the gay community, or whether the first scene of the film, divorced as it is from all context, is simply a flash forward showing Matthias attempting suicide after being rejected by Philip. Coming out was definitely made with the support of the government. The scenes in Philip and Tanya's house were filmed in the house of Lothar Biski, a politician with two openly gay sons and the rector of the University of Film and Television. However, despite the not at all subtle propaganda for the government, coming out doesn't pretend that life for LGBT people is perfect, in the GDR or otherwise. But leaving its societal importance aside, is coming out worth watching? Coming Out's story is hardly novel, not for its time period, let alone in this day and age. However, it's such a strangely paced film with so many bizarre cultural happenings and moments that one can't help taking an interest. The film is positive towards queer people, but it doesn't pretend that being queer is necessarily easy. It's free from pointless maudlin hand-wringing, the gay people in the film are allowed to have personalities, sexual desire and agency, and unusually for a film from this time period, there's absolutely no mention of the AIDS crisis. In terms of the characters' lives, opportunities and relationships with each other, I'm not entirely sure how accurate the film is, given my limited knowledge of East Berlin. After all, this is a film created by a state-run film company. How much interest did they actually have in creating a realistic depiction of East Germany? There are other films which better capture the oppressive nature of the regime, something which, given where and when this film was made, was obviously impossible to show. This is the first day for film I've seen, and the idea of a whole separate film industry intrigues me. I'd love to see what the other films Eastern Germany came up with were like. I'd hardly call this one of the best queer films I've ever seen, but it's certainly unique. It has a different perspective from many English language queer films from this time period, and in terms of documenting ridiculous clothing styles, unintentionally hilarious music, and lumpy Eastern Bloc architecture, it's almost as good as Hallo aus Berlin. Ich höre gerne Musik und tanze sehr gerne. Almost. Also, if you love watching gastric lavage and nosebleeds, you're not going to get a better film than this. So that was coming out. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go. Really, I've got to go right now. There is a wall that runs right through me, just like the city.